Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this online tour of Art to Lunch. Uh, my name is Trip Cardiff. I am I work in the education department at San Antonio Museum of Art. Uh, I'm the docent program manager, and I think I saw that we are joined by a few of our docents. Hi, Rosario. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Lorene. A few familiar faces. Hi. Um, Hi. How, how many of you all, because um, Art to Lunch is, it's a, it's a tour that happens twice a month, usually on the first and third Thursdays at 1230. Um, how many of you all have been able to join us in the past? I see Lynn there. Hi. 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 Nope. No. No. Oh, no. Yes. Some yeses, some noes. Okay. Well, for those of you who uh, who have been able to join us, um, welcome back. And for those of you for whom this is new, uh, a hearty welcome to you as well. Um, the way that these tours work is... Um, they're usually short and sweet. Um, it says a half hour on the 10, although those of you who have joined me in person know that sometimes we, we push it to like 45 minutes or so. I'm really bad about sticking to a half hour. Um, so they're short and sweet and I try to keep them nice and light and fun, playful, interactive, conversational. So um, all of that to say that, um, that your participation is encouraged. And uh, please feel free to participate in this online tour, uh, however you feel comfortable. So um, got a couple of options. On your screen somewhere, your Zoom window, there should be a button for uh, muting and unmuting your microphone. So if you would, uh, if you'd like to say something, share an observation, or ask a question, um, you can click that button to unmute your microphone and, uh, and, and feel free to speak up. Uh, you can also, for those of you who are at a computer, whether a desktop or, um, or a laptop, if you, if you have a keyboard, you can hold the space bar down to uh, unmute yourself for as long as you hold the space bar. Um, so that's a handy little push to talk. Uh, mm, that's interesting. Um, so feel free to uh, feel free to use that voice uh, functionality. Mm -hmm. um, there's also that uh, that little button there next to it call, uh, for starting your video. You're welcome to use your webcam uh, if you want. If you're you know, but if you're still in your pajamas or you know, haven't done hair. yeah, <laughs> haven't done your hair or you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, then, uh, you know, that's, that's purely optional. Uh, your second option is the text chat function. Uh, so that'll also live on your Zoom, uh, Zoom bar. I've highlighted it here in the blue circle. You can click that to bring up a chat window and it'll function just like any sort of instant messenger, uh, or Facebook messenger app that you might be familiar with. You can type a message in. Uh, hit enter, and that'll send it to a uh, to a communal chat window. Um, I am joined by my colleague uh, Johanna Tesfai. She is going to be serving as our chat overlord, so she'll be uh, be keeping an eye out on uh, on anything coming in on the chat to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, so, if you want to say hi to everyone, Johanna. Hey everyone, um, I also will add in there that if you um, aren't speaking or asking a question yet, if you could mute your mics just so that, you know, sometimes there's background noises or feedback and we just want to minimize that so everyone has a really great tour experience. But yes, please feel free to unmute yourself when you have a question for Trip. Likewise, if you feel more comfortable with chatting, um, I'll be there and I'll for sure will try to read your questions and get them answered by Trip. So it's um, all up to you and how you would like to participate. But I am here. Okay, are there any questions off the bat about the tour format, about the, you know, Zoom and how those buttons work?
Okay, so hearing none, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So today's tour is um, was originally scheduled to happen on April 2nd, so it was a little bit more timely then, but you know, April Fools, jokes, humor, that's always, that's always fun. So uh, our theme today is April Fools, and specifically, uh, we're going to be taking a look at visual humor. Um, when I when I use that phrase, what what does that mean to you? When I when I say that phrase, visual humor, what is that all about? Something unexpected. Deborah said, "Inside joke." Okay, it could be an inside joke. It could be something unexpected. Humor often comes from defying expectations. Um, uh, I see Lorraine is pointing out double meaning. You know, there could be two meanings behind uh, the representation of something. Um, any other thoughts on that visual humor? Uh, would that be something like body language in other words you're just seeing it you're not hearing anything so it's your interpretation of what you're seeing yeah so so that's a big component of it i think is uh you know in the, in the name visual humor it's something that uh that we can see humor that we can we can read with our eyeballs we don't it doesn't depend on uh either uh, spoken or written language. It's um, the humor is is or is in the image itself. So uh, Emily, I see in the chat is pointing out that uh, when she thinks of visual humor, she thinks of memes. Um, that's that's kind of also what I think of these days is um, is memes. And in fact, I have one for you all on screen here. Um, so uh, I, I just want to get your reactions to this this image. What do you observe? What do you uh, notice about it? Do you find it humorous or amusing? And it's a little pixelated, for which I apologize. It's blown up out of Instagram. So yeah. Are we? Uh, yes, Deborah loves this. Theme of uh, the Last Supper. Is that what we're supposed to be seeing? Is that what we're supposed to be seeing? The Last Supper. I mean, you tell me. Is that is that what's supposed to be going on here? We have. Um, they're practicing good social distancing from the chat. Okay, so uh, as as Rosario pointed out, it looks like we're looking at at least a version of Da Vinci's famous Last Supper. Um, but there are some notable differences, as, um, as someone pointed out. Uh, we've got, you know, good social distancing practices uh, at play here. Uh, we have the various apostles you can see kind of up in their individual Zoom windows, uh, phoning in, uh, much like we're doing, to, uh, to a Zoom meeting, to, to a virtual Last Supper, so very appropriate for this this time that we that we find ourselves in. But um, so this is it, this is an example of visual humor, especially as how we might uh, how we might find it today, uh, which is meme culture. You know, online things that are shared uh, in image form on Facebook or Instagram um, or Twitter, any of these these other uh, platforms. And the joke is the image itself. Um, you know, there's, there's not really any text. There's no like spoken punchline. It's just the image itself uh, is the source of the humor. And as, as someone pointed out earlier, it's, it plays with our expectations. You know, we see that we see Renaissance painting and we, you know, uh, we think of, you know, the great master Leonardo da Vinci, uh, da Vinci. and uh, 
but we also notice the that it's it's all like squashed into this like desktop and there's a toolbar at the bottom and the top and there are the zoom windows and we see that uh you know jay christ is getting is getting good wi-fi signal you know so so it's it's playing with our our expectations um so Trent, we're going to take you a know look. when the last yes. supper was painted i don't <laughs> off the top of my head i'm sorry okay um i think it was like the 1450s but don't yeah quote me on renaissance that. era yeah. adrian mm -hmm. um so so this is an example of how we might encounter visual humor uh today but artists have been have been employing visual humor for uh for millennia in fact so we're going to look at a few examples of how artists use visual humor uh to uh to you know make the viewer chuckle make the viewer laugh or enjoy the experience of looking at a work of art uh just a little bit more with that with that touch of humor uh thank you michelle uh, michelle has pointed out that this was painted between 1495 and 1498. I should probably know that bad, bad art historian. So. Just connected with the discovery of America. There we go. Yeah, that's a good tip. Okay, so let's, uh, let's rewind a bit and, and take a look at <laughs> this piece that I have on the screen for you here. Uh, and I'd like to just ask for your initial impressions or observations. Doesn't have to be anything, you know, super deep or interpretive. Just what are we looking at here? The bottom of a drinking bowl. So Rosario looks to you like the bottom of a drinking bowl. Um, a drinking cup, yeah. Drinking cup, okay. Um, any other initial observations? Yeah. Looks pretty scary. Noticing eyes. Um, yeah. Brandon has, he says big eyes. Patricia is also saying eyes. Lindsay says it looks like a face. So there's a lot of um, facial recognition in this right now. Yeah. So we're, we're noticing uh, some elements of a face here. Those big googly eyes right there on, uh, on the front. Um, uh, I think I, I saw, oh. go ahead, Johanna. That it's suggestive of an animal, very anthropomorphic. Okay, so maybe suggestive of an animal face or anthropomorphic, uh, meaning that it's, um, it has human-like qualities. So an inanimate object, a drinking bowl, becoming kind of human with these, these big eyeballs. Um, Adrian asked if this is Egyptian. Uh, is it Egyptian? We're we're pretty close. Um, head Greek. just just north across the Mediterranean, and you will end up in Greece. Um, this is an ancient Greek uh, drinking vessel from the sixth century uh, BCE, so quite old, over two thousand years old. Um, so the Greeks have often been credited as being some of the early pioneers in visual humor. Um, or, you know, if we want to think about it as memes, they were the first ones to produce dank memes. Um, so, and I, I've got a couple of slides that'll help us kind of illustrate what's going on here, but, um, uh, bring up, yes. Uh, the, these are in fact called eye cups. Um, there are a number of these in our collection at the museum, uh, also in other collections around the world. These, these cups with these great big, googly eyes on the bottom. So these were, they seem to have been quite popular goods um, for buying and having, you know, in your, in your kitchen or in your, you know, for your drinking parties. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, the audio is being kind of spotty. Is, is anyone else having problems with the audio? Not anymore. I did at the beginning. Okay. No. All right. I hope that problem goes away. So I'm just trying to make sure that my microphone is plugged in well. Okay. Seems like it's it's going okay for for most people. 
Um, so an eye cup uh, is, is what these are, these are called in, uh, in the industry. Um, so how do these things uh, work? Uh, as Rosario mentioned earlier, these are, uh, these are for, for drinking. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty large uh, bowl or, or vessel. Um, as you can see in the, in the little tombstone information, it's about 14 inches in diameter, so, so fairly large. Um, and these would have been used at ancient Greek uh, symposia, uh, which is basically a fancy term for a drinking party. So uh, you as an Athenian, uh, you know, middle to upper class male would host these, uh, these social gatherings with all of, your, uh, all of your buds and you would get together and uh, consume wine and at least ostensibly talk about very lofty topics like philosophy and politics and all of that stuff. Um, but these, these were opportunities, because there's quite a bit of wine involved, uh, these were also opportunities for some play and for some games and jokes. Um, and one of, the, one of the kind of games that's going on here involves this cup. So let me move ahead to the next slide here. So, okay, we've got some help from our model here, Socrates. Um, famous Athenian uh, philosopher. And let's imagine that he is at a drinking party with, with some of his colleagues, some of his friends, and they're probably discussing philosophy, you know, the nature of love or the human soul, you know, very, very highfalutin kind of topics. But throughout the evening and throughout the course of discussion, you are drinking wine out of these big cups. So uh, Socrates is starting to feel a little, uh, little thirsty, so he is going to bring the cup up to his face and take a sip of the wine. And what happens when he does this? He hides his face. He hides his face, his face. in a way. The eyes so take over for his eyes. Those, those big googly eyes take over for his eyes. Um, yeah, it, it replaces uh, his face, or it's another way of thinking about it is that he's, he's putting on a mask every time he takes a sip from, from his cup, yeah. Um, for those of you who maybe know a little bit about um, Dionysus, uh, he is a god of wine. He is also a god of the theater, and the ancient Greeks performed their theater uh, with masks. So there, there's also a connection uh, going on there as well. So every time you take a sip out of one of these eye cups, you are putting on a mask. You're putting on this kind of uh, playful, you know, expression with great big eyes. Uh, you've got, if you think about the handles as being ears, that kind of adds to the, the mask-like quality. And even the foot, even the base of the cup becomes kind of a like almost a silly puckered mouth. Um, so every, every time you're taking a sip of wine, um, you're putting this, this playful mask on. Any, uh, any other thoughts or observations about the exterior of this, of this cup? Or any questions? Marina said the eyes are looking at the spectator, kind of narrowing the focus. It's kind yeah. of... I've got a mask over my face, but I'm still part of the party. Yeah, so, you know, even though you've got your face in this big bowl uh, and you're, you're kind of removing yourself momentarily from the party, you still, like, you're still able to, you know, look outward uh, and, and participate in, in the activities of the party. Um, yeah, so... Um, on the screen right now, it looks like the eyes are in the correct location. Mm -hmm. But if they were trying to drink at that level, they would pour it straight into their shirt. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I've maybe not quite, you know, got the, uh, the physics, you know, quite down here. It should probably be a little bit higher up, but um, right. for illustrative purposes yeah. only, you know. Well, I think... I think this is directions. 
I think he's also trying to get the attention of the spectator, the person who said, are you listening to me? You know, he looks pretty scary. At those yeah. <laughs> there, so there, there was that question of yeah. um, what's the role of the spectator in all yeah. of this? You know, if we imagine ourselves sitting across from dear old Socrates, <laughs> um, how are we involved in this, in this kind of humorous uh, exchange with, with the, the mask and the cup? Um, there is, um, th this could have, uh, uh, we had a, a tour, a virtual tour a little bit uh, last week, I guess it was, about the gaze and about how we look at art and how art looks back at us. Mm -hmm. And there are elements of that going on here. Um, there was, a, there's an ancient Greek tradition uh, belief. And in fact, it's still intact in a lot of places in the Eastern Mediterranean today, uh, the concept of the evil eye. And uh, the, the belief was that, um, that the, the eye, the gaze of someone could uh, potentially be harmful. So um, if someone is looking at you jealously or, you know, they've got, you know, they're shooting daggers out of their eyes, um, that could potentially harm you physically and, and mentally and emotionally. So one way to counteract the, the influence of a negative look is to, um, is to have an evil eye with you as like, you know, maybe on a, on a necklace or some kind of talisman. Uh, as long as you can have another eyeball to counteract that gaze, then you could be safe. So if you think about being at a, at a drinking party with your peers. And if you've got your face deep in a bowl, you can't potentially counteract uh, the, the malicious gaze of someone else at the party or the, the jealous gaze of someone at the party. But when you, when you put that mask on, you've still got those eyeballs to do the work for you. They can potentially counteract that, that negative gaze. So the spectator, all of that to say that the spectator is involved in the, in the process of, of looking and being looked at you know, with this piece. Um, let's look at the inside because the inside of the cup is also important. And it's what I would say is, uh, at least to me, even more humorous than the outside of the cup. So, um, Let's imagine now that we are in, we're in Socrates' uh, shoes. We're looking at the cup from his perspective, and we're lifting it up to our mouths to take a sip. And what do we see? You know, we've just arrived at the party, and we've got this full cup of wine uh, that we're sipping on. Um, we don't see a whole lot in, inside the cup. Um, it's been painted mostly black and it's full of wine, so we can't see very much. But as the evening progresses and as we take more and more sips from our cup of wine, uh, what begins to happen? The level of the wine yeah, drops. Or, the wine. Yeah. yeah, there's less wine in the cup and we start to notice that there's something that's been painted on the inside of this cup. I wonder what it is. Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to drink more wine. <laughs> so we continue sipping on our wine throughout the evening, and what do we discover? Oh. <laughs> how, 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 how would you feel at how, discovering that at the bottom of your glass? April Fool's. Looks like April Fools, or he's had too much to drink. Look at his eyes. He looks a little. <laughs> he's got crazy eyes, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so this suddenly appears to you at the bottom of your cup. Um, this is, um, there's a fancy name for this in, um, in art history. It's called a Gorgoneon. And you might recognize the term Gorgon in that. Um, so yeah, I see Maria pointing out that we've got a Gorgon, be careful. Um, is anyone familiar with uh, Gorgons from mythology? What's, what's so scary about them? 
uh, wasn't the one who turns you into stone and gorgon, Medea. That's right. Yeah. So you're you're thinking of um of Medusa, the most famous of the Gordons. Medusa. Medusa. Um, Medusa. So her gaze, she was so frightening, so scary that one look alone uh, could could turn you into stone. So, you know, it's we've we've got kind of a practical joke being played on on a guest at a party here. That um. Uh, the more that you drink, the more that you expose this kind of frightening, but like playful uh, image of a monster in the bottom of your cup. Any uh, any other thoughts or or questions, observations about this piece? Adrian asked, were these drinking cups in every household or for the wealthy only? So that's a really good question. Um, the painted examples, the decorated examples like this one, uh, these were like your fine china. Um, th these were your, it was like your good stemware. Um, a, a more modest household might have uh, versions of these that were just all black uh, with that, that hard black kind of glaze on the outside. Um, there might be some decorations kind of scratched into it but generally speaking, the more embellished they become with painted decoration, they're gonna cost a little bit more. So um, uh, these, these types of things, I would say were probably for kind of your mid to upper like classes. Um, that's who th these sorts of things were marketed towards. Uh, but but every, uh, almost every household would, would have some sort of drinking cup similar to this. It might be smaller, it might be a little bit more simple, but the, the general form, shape of it would be the same. All right, shall we look at another piece? Yes. Okay. Aren't these cups uh, supposed to be communal cups? So I'm wondering if they're passing them on from one drinker to the other, <laughs> it would be the last one that would have the last look, right? Yeah, so that, that is an aspect of the symposium um, that, that was fairly common. It's that uh, the cups would get passed around. Um, and so you could, all, you could think of this maybe as like, um, uh, if, if the cup is being passed around, it's kind of like a, like a game of duck duck goose sort of uh, i guess is the the best example i can think of that you know who's going to be the goose who's going to end up with the gorgon uh at the bottom of the cup staring staring him down so there there's a there's a bit of playfulness and humor involved there as well all right Hot potato, thank you, Michelle. That's that's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, like hot potato or musical chairs or something like that. Chairs, yeah. All right. Here's our second piece. Like it's a group of objects. Um, tell me your first impressions. It's the dogs playing poker. <laughs> it's the dogs playing poker. Uh, what do you mean by that? Can you tell me a little I mean, bit more about the connection a, you're making? It's a different version of the dogs playing poker. These are dogs, right? Uh, these oh, are they're they're meant they're to be monkeys. monkeys. Oh, sorry. Um, Monkey. poker. Yeah, but um, so you're, you're drawing a connection with that famous um, uh, kind of silly painting of the dogs mm -hmm. all sitting around a poker table playing poker, they've got drinks. I think some of them are like smoking cigars and, and um, but yeah, playing, playing poker. Um, animals doing something they don't do. Yeah, animals doing yeah. something they don't normally do. Um, doing some kind of human activity, things that, you know, that, that we usually do. Um, uh, why, why is that? I'm sorry, Johanna, go ahead. It's anthropomorphic. Yes, so th there's that word again um, that I guess that's probably our word of the day, 
uh, anthropomorphic. Um, so they have these human-like uh, features or qualities, characteristics. Um, it's kind of, yeah, uh, another way of saying that they're, they're doing things or they're appearing in a way that you know, people normally do. Um, what's, why, why is this funny? Why, why produce well, works like this? Just the idea that, that these animals could play is funny, but them getting organized enough and playing with some sort of talent is hysterical. Yeah, we're, like by looking at this, we're to imagine, we, I mean, we start to imagine this whole story of mm -hmm. these monkeys. They've, they've all independently learned to play these instruments. We've got an oboe player, a flautist. He's got a violin. Uh, it looks like this guy's got bagpipes, you know, and they've got a conductor. Like, so they, they've all learned these instruments and they're, they're coming together, they're organized and they're playing, uh, playing a piece. And what's funny is, I'm assuming this is good quality painting and porcelain. And why would you put all that effort into a monkey? <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah. There, so there is this question of like, of why, like, you know, they've, they've been carefully molded and painted and like, what's the, what might be the, the story or like the message behind these pieces? So Adrian is saying it's humor and then Daniel's pointing out that it's... I would imagine that... Sorry, uh, Johanna, go ahead and finish and then... And then Rosario. Um, Daniel saying that's poking fun of humans that are silly wigs and zany clothes. Okay, so picking up on the costume of uh, of these these little monkey orchestra members, and that it's maybe um, making light of the way that you know we as people you know dress ourselves up to feel all you know all fancy and cultured, and so yeah, so there could be some. Uh, some humor there as well. Uh, Rosario, you had a, a thought but it, as well. it's, a, it's a particular type of clothing. I think they're making fun of court and people who are very involved in the court of a particular king. I don't know when these were made, but it might have been criticizing the court of Louis the Fourteenth or something like that. Yeah, so again, picking up on the costume, it, it's kind of taking us to a certain time and place perhaps, you know, maybe a few hundred years ago in the court of some nobleman. So uh, here's, the, here's a little tombstone information. Um, these are from a couple hundred years ago, from the late 19th century. Um, and, and they were in fact produced uh, as, um, uh, they were designed to be like little table decorations, you know, again, perhaps at, a, at some kind of party or something. And they were, in fact, the audience for this were, um, were kind of the upper, upper classes, the, the nobility. And it's, um, it's a way of kind of gently making fun of yourself, you know, and all the pomp and circumstance, all of the airs that you put on your day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, going to court and um, uh, interacting with, uh, with dukes and duchesses and counts and countesses. Yeah, uh, Trip. what's kind of interesting also is looking at the eye cups, that's kind of a utilitarian piece of, of uh, what was it, terracotta. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, people are having to spend extra money to pay for this. We're not talking, you know, their best china or so. This is something that's, uh, that's very playful. And um, so it has a whole different purpose. And the people who have the money pay for this, I guess. Yeah, so... You're right, uh, something to Oh, sorry, go ahead. Tony. Something totally useless. Something totally sorry, useless, something, right? It's, yes. It's, it it's, doesn't have an obvious uh, yeah. 
useful purpose like that cup. You know, if the cup holds liquid, we drink from it. It, it has a, a function. Um, these are, are seem to be purely decorative, you know, designed to just... Chotsky. Chotsky, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, Chotsky. It's a society yeah. that can afford to pay for materials like this that are totally playful. Mm -hmm. It's um, this is this is more or less the birth of the knickknack um, that we that we see here. You know, the the sorts of little you know playful objects um, that are coming out of these uh, these ceramics factories in Europe. You know, starting in the in the 1700s. So, um, I, I will point out um, that, you know, maybe you are smitten by these pieces. You, you love them. You wish you had one for yourself. Uh, well, you are in luck because they are still available from <laughs> the exact same porcelain found factory today. Uh, those those oh. came from the, the Meissen uh, porcelain factory outside of Dresden in Germany. And uh, you too can get your own monkey oh. orchestra <laughs> trumpeter for the low, low price of 2,190 euros. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'll notice that the, uh, that the, the painting has changed a little bit, uh, but the, the form of it is, is basically exactly the same. This factory uh, has a huge archive of the molds and stuff that they <laughs> that they've used over the hundred years of or hundreds of years of business, and they reissue things from the vaults. So, wow! According to the internet, it's uh, the oldest factory uh, porcelain, uh, oldest porcelain manufacturer, the German. It that's like a German style, like me for me. But, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, this comes from a porcelain factory in Germany, in, in Meissen, um, just outside of Dresden. And um, they were the first, um, the first place in Europe uh, to reverse engineer Chinese porcelain. Um, so for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, the Chinese were the only ones who knew how to make porcelain, this very, very fine uh, thin, translucent, elegant uh, ceramic ware, and um, it was super expensive because it came from, all the way from China, and um, the uh, German scientists were able to kind of recreate it. Uh, they they found the magic ingredients uh, nearby, and they were able to to produce porcelain for themselves. So. Um, we have a question thinking about, you know, maybe these products are for children or is this related maybe to magical realism? What are your thoughts? Um, I don't, I don't know that they would have been at least originally intended for children. I mean, they're, they certainly have kind of, a, um, a playfulness to them, um, but um, the the designer, um, his name was Johann Joachim Kendler, I think. He he, uh, he you know he put a lot of thought into these, and there are twenty one different monkeys with their different instruments, and there are some singers, and um, uh, and and he he really considered them to be like lofty social commentary. You know, all all of the silly airs that we put on. Um, you know, for, uh, for our court activities. So I think they were maybe intended as, um, as being like little collector's items, little knickknacks, little playful tchotchkes for the elite um, to kind of gently poke fun at themselves. Um, but I, I, I think you're, you're, you're really tapping into that kind of child or that, that playfulness uh, that's inherent in these figures. Um, and then are they magical realism? Uh, or, or, you know, would we, would we consider them kind of in that, in that category? Um, I don't know, really. You know, I don't know a ton about magical realism as a genre. Johanna, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, 
Yeah, I I would understand why you would want to put this in, under magical realism, but you know, um, yeah, that that kind of came out during the twentieth century and thinking about um, artists and thinking like the other, I guess. Well, the other could be a loaded term, but um, just this exploration of ideas. And I think um, Daniel is saying that uh, it kind of sparks the exploration of the vibe of that particular time period with um, thinking about exotic places, the new world, mm -hmm. and monkeys. Yeah, totally. I think there is some of that going on in these pieces. If we, um, let's see if I go back. Uh, we can even see that we have a figure here in the back in this green coat has this this kind of um, Middle Eastern inspired, you know, head headwear uh, with the, the feather. Um, yeah, that was it was very fashionable at this time to have, you know, things that remind you of these, you know, these faraway places or that evoke these, you know, quote unquote, exotic locales. I, I would add that these could be looked at with a racial lens as well, um, thinking about these kind of misplaced ideas about the exotic and mm -hmm. the other in terms of non-white Germans um, and playing yeah. around with that. Yeah, I think that can be a way to read these as well. I think it's a really interesting route to take, so um, but I will just point out that that is a little bit less humorous than maybe we were intending for this this uh, particular yeah. session. <laughs> well, but maybe this is a satire on the court life. And I was thinking if it were done today, we can imagine that maybe they would put faces of politicians and do <laughs> we dare think they might be represented? That would be pretty funny. Yeah, that is a fun way to kind of approach these. You know, what would they look like if they were made today? I mean, they are made today, but you know, if they if they were In the kind US. of reconceptualized yeah. for for today, uh, what would they look like? What would they be wearing? What would they be holding? Um, yeah, uh, create your own and uh, and who, who would post they it on social like? media. Let us know. Hashtag Shama, <laughs> Shama shares. <laughs> okay. okay, I've got a, a couple more things that I, I'd like to share with you all. Um, so uh, porcelain, we, we mentioned that uh, a little bit earlier that um, for a really long time, China uh, had a monopoly on porcelain production and export. And as it so happens, there's a long history of very kind of like subtle humor in Chinese porcelains. So let's look in at, at an example here. And uh, what I'll do is I will uh, zoom in a little bit for everyone. And I just like to invite you to take a moment to look at this piece and I can pan up and down um, and think about, you know, what, what do you see? All right. You see what? Um, what do you find? So we see the surface here. Daniel says deers and bats. Adrian saying jungle of animals and insects. Emily saying deers. So we're noticing right off the bat, uh, deer. We've got a lot of deer. Uh, little groups of them, kind of all over the surface of this vessel, and it. It goes onto the back as well. And I've got a picture of the back a little bit later. Um, bats, where do we see the bats? Top. Up at the top here, yeah. Now this, this might be a little harder to make out because they're kind of stylized, but we have 
Uh, the ones, the little shapes here with the very hooked ends, uh, these are the, the wings of the bats, and these are the little round bat bodies. So we've got bats all Patricia's over the neck the here. Sorry, what about the handles? Um, Patricia's noticing that they kind of remind her of bird heads. So maybe another another creature of some sort being represented here uh, kind of looks like a bird, maybe. Any other thoughts on these these handles over here? Elephant. Maybe an elephant. Yeah, we've got we've got something going on here with the uh, either a trunk or a beak of some sort. Um, so we've got lots of animals covering the surface of of this vessel. Um, and this is meant to be subtly humorous. Um, are you laughing? No. I don't get the joke. Don't get the joke. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. It's a bit of an inside joke. You have to speak Chinese. That's, oh. that's the only problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't speak Chinese. Fortunately, I have reference books. So, um, <laughs> so let's, let's, Let's learn the joke kind of together, and um, and we'll see if it's still not funny at the end. You can be the judge. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Chinese art is very, very well known for its incredibly rich uh, system of symbolism and associations. And most of, uh, or a lot of the symbolism is based on puns um, based on dad jokes, basically. Um, so the deer that we see all over the surface of, of this vessel, um, and excuse me, I need to consult my notes for the Chinese. Um, deer in Chinese is lu, L-U. And it sounds exactly like the Chinese word for an official's salary, uh, a bureaucrat's salary, a, a government worker's salary. Um, so we've got lots of deer, said lu in Chinese, which sounds like uh, the word for a government worker's salary. Um, is it funny yet? Keep going. Keep going, okay. Keep going. <laughs> So let's talk They're about the okay. let's talk about the bats. All right. Um, My so baby the bats overpaid, overpaid in comparison to the rest of our, our population because uh, yeah. I mean uh, Chinese officials. Oh, it could be a dig. Yeah, maybe government yeah. officials are overpaid. We've got so many deer, referencing so many official salaries. Maybe so. It's gonna cost you a government salary to have it. You might have to be on a government salary to afford something like this. Yes. That's, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Uh, our little bats here, uh, the Chinese word for these guys is fu, F-U. And it also sounds exactly like the word for, um, for happiness or good luck. Is it funny yet? Yeah, you're pretty yeah. lucky to get a government job. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I didn't guarantee that you'd be rolling on the floor, but this is <laughs> this is the joke. Um, yeah. This this is um, this is called a hundred deer vase. Um, there are lots of these that uh, that we have in in Chinese art collections, and. Um, that is, that's basically the joke. Get a cushy jo government job, make a lot of money, and you'll be happy. You'll be well off. Um, so oh. lots and lots of deer referencing those, those fat government paychecks, which in, in Imperial China, being a government official was a very well-paying job. And lots of bats representing lots of good fortune, lots of, of happiness that Make a lot of money, you know. Live a live a live a happy life. So. Well, that is funny. Yes. Yes. Um, I 
I see that Daniel is pointing out that this could be an honorary gift for someone as uh, maybe a way of congratulating them um, or wishing them, you know, good luck in their political careers and um, and uh, and a good, you know, you know, lots of wealth and happiness. Um, and that is, yeah, the, the, there was kind of a culture of exchanging things like this as as gifts, as um, uh, one of the ways that I like to think of them is kind of like Hallmark cards. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you could, you could send this to a buddy of yours who maybe got a promotion um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a way of congratulating them with this kind of very gentle pun humor. Um, yeah. Yeah, wishing them, you know, much, much, uh, many promotions, lots of wealth, lots of happiness in their future endeavors. So, um, maybe not funny to us, but there is, there is some humor kind of buried underneath the surface of this piece. And it's all, like I said, it's all based on dad oh. jokes. It's all based on puns, um, words that sound, um, really? sound the same. Trip, do we know what the uh, other very uh, uh, important design there, the waves, what those might be, what those might stand for? There's some in the bottom and some in, right under the... Here, let's go, let's zoom in here. Um, are you asking about these shapes right here, Rosario? Probably about... Mm -hmm. Is this what you're curious about? Water. Yes. Water. And there's yeah. Water. Um, so, th I mean, there are a couple of elements um, at play here. Um, the. Um, I mean, here's more cliffs. We have pine trees uh, growing in these kind of craggy cliffs. And uh, this is often in Chinese art a symbol of longevity. No. no. Um, the faces, the little animals. Deer can also be a symbol for longevity, depending on the context. So um, uh, deer antlers are still used in traditional Chinese medicine as um, a way of extending one's Ooh. life. Um, so in addition to all of these, you know, wishes for uh, promotions and, you know, fat paychecks and lots of happiness, uh, we may have some, some wishes in here for a, for a very long life at that. You said there were a bunch of hundred deer vases, many, many examples of them. Do they all have the bats? Do they all make the same pun or are they all different? So the, uh, the key element for a hundred deer vase is going to be the deer. Um, we've got lots and lots of deer. Um, that's what makes it a, a 100 deer vase. Uh, the bats are not necessary but um, they're almost ubiquitous in Chinese art. You find uh, court robes covered in bats. You find, you know, chargers covered in bats. You find, um, you know, other works of ceramics covered in bats. They're, they're just all over the place because they're such a good catch-all uh, symbol for, um, for happiness. Again, based on that, that pun, the words that sound similar. Um, so the bats aren't necessary to the 100 deer um, uh, design, but they're just super duper common in Chinese art. You'll find if you come, when we open up again, you come into our Chinese uh, galleries, keep an eye out for these little bats. Um, I think you'll be surprised at how often they show up just all over the place. And now you know the code, the secret code. Yes, yeah. secret code. <laughs> All right, here was the back of it, by the way. Uh, you can see it's, it's, we've got more deer, more deer, more rocks, um, more bats. Are there actually a hundred deer? Did anybody count them? Uh, I counted <laughs> on the front and, um, I came up with 38, so uh, I haven't counted the ones on the back yet, but we're pretty 
maybe pretty close to a hundred deer. Uh, it's more of a more of a figure of of speech. Um, um, oh yeah, that was something that I I didn't quite mention. Um, the the word for one hundred is bai in Chinese, and uh, bai lu uh, literally, you know, if you break that that word apart, it's one hundred deer. When you stick those together and say bai lu it means a um, hundred promotions. So, you know, again, we have those, um, uh, those puns, visual puns, uh, wishing someone a long and successful career. Great, we have to go, but thank you so much, enjoy. All right, yeah, thanks yeah. for joining us. Um, yeah, I realize this has been going longer than, uh, than we thought. So if, you, if you've gotta go, uh, that's totally fine. Um, but if you, uh, if you'd like to stick around a little bit longer, I've got one more piece that I want to share with you all. And that is this one. This is one of my absolute favorites in the museum. Um, what's going on in this painting? I don't know. They don't look like they're getting a joke, though. Who, who doesn't look like they're getting the joke? Any of them. <laughs> Any of them? They've got, uh, let me, let me pop ahead here. Maybe the bird. So these, uh, these figures, what do we make of their facial expressions? Well, they're praying. Praying, perhaps? They're communing with God. Okay. What do you see that suggests they might be praying? The hand, the face. The hands. Okay, yeah, if we, if we go back a little bit. I like the hand. The sort of light from above. This light from above, yeah, the heavens kind of opening up. Um, yeah, their hands, they seem to be making important gestures with their hands, perhaps praying yes. or... Beautiful hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nicely, nicely rendered. And from the chat, we have that these figures look like monks from Patricia. Maria added that the Saint turning food into a bird slash was a vegetarian. Yeah, so Maria is one of our docents. She already knows the story behind this piece. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and share it with you all. Um, this is depicting a fellow named uh, Saint Nicholas of Tolentino, not the Saint Nicholas that was the inspiration for Santa Claus, different Saint Nicholas, there's a couple of them. Um, and so he was a, uh, he was a 13th century, um, friar who belonged to the Augustan, uh, or the, uh, excuse me, the Augustinian, um, order, which, uh, we can tell by their, uh, dark black robes. Um, so that was, that was what they wore. And, uh, St. Nicholas was a vegetarian. And so he was, he was traveling to, uh, to another, excuse me, he was, he was traveling to another um, uh, cloister or church and um, he was served a meal upon his arrival by some of his fellow um, members of the order. They didn't know that he was a vegetarian, very, very strict vegetarian, and they served him, um, they served him a game fowl. And this upset him you know, as, as a vegetarian and, you know, he, he grieved the unnecessary loss of life of this poor bird. And so he made the sign of the cross and wouldn't you know it, the bird, even though it was presumably cooked and plucked and all of that, uh, came by, back to life, um, this, this little uh, miracle. And the bird flies out the window, you know, totally unharmed and unscathed. So... Uh, so now, knowing that story, how was the artist choosing to represent that story? I just like his brooch on his chest. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. This right here. I think that's uh, not very Christian. Very, uh, yeah, this like this, let's zoom in here. 
astrology. Yeah, solar um, kind of motif. Yeah, so it reminds you of like maybe astrological iconography yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting observation. I don't quite know what to make of his brooch myself. Well, they sure don't. I mean, usually you see him with the big crosses. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, his, his robe is covered in, in these little stars here as well. Different. He looks almost like a magician. He looks like a magician. Uh, what is it that you're looking at that makes him look like the robe, a magic man? The robe, the, the solar thing, the brooch. Oh, okay. So the the robe, yeah. Now that you mention that, doesn't um. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that these friars had sparkly robes like that. But yeah. Right. Yeah. Often they take a vow of poverty, and um, okay. but yeah. Now that you mention that, it, his robe kind of reminds me of um. What is it from? Fantasia, Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Uh, doesn't he have a robe that's covered in a little stars, kind of like that? The Sorcerer and Apprentice. Yes. Yes, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, yeah. Is this work of art from Europe or is it made in the um, Americas? This is made in the Americas. Okay. Um, did I forget to include that? I did. Um, I, for some reason, I wanna say Bolivia, but I'm not sure that's correct. But it, it, it's, from, it's from the Americas. I think they're poking fun at these uh, things that saints were purported to have done. Uh, so poking fun, perhaps. What What do you think? And so, full disclosure, I have absolutely no idea if this image is meant to be humorous. Okay. Um, Early but... century. I don't know if they'd have been poking fun, especially in the Americas. Yeah. So it it yeah. may be completely serious. It may be meant to be totally straight. This like this telling of of a uh, of an important moment in this in this saint's life this miracle um uh but i cannot help but look at this and kind of chuckle to myself um uh the the faces on these guys like let's zoom in again saint nicholas here looks just so over it, so like, you know, disgusted, like, ugh, not again, almost. And this guy here, and well, especially this, this figure over here, they just look so disappointed in themselves. Like, oh, I can't believe we served him, bird. I, you know, totally forgot. And as um, was it, I saw in the chat, Gretchen points out, it kind of looks like the bird is having one last laugh. You know, he's he's got this like victory pose going on with his his wings like up in the air. So, as I said, I have no idea if this is meant to be humorous, but especially, you know, the situation that we all sort of find ourselves in, I think it's important to try to find humor in uh, in in you know everyday situations or or. Uh, images and and I think you know whether intentional or not I think there is some humorous potential in uh, in this particular painting and so um, as, a, as a way of kind of wrapping up let's have a little bit of fun um, in the chat uh, why don't you go ahead and take a stab at captioning this Caption that painting. This is like, don't they do this in the New York Times every once in a while? You can also share it if you have an idea verbally. Don't have to write it in the chat. Yeah. It's kind of like the dude on the our right is saying, here you go, this is it. And the guy in the middle is kind of eye rolling and saying like, oh, this again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there's something about his face that tells me this is not the first time it's happened. Like, ugh, 
again with the birds. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> yeah. See, Barbara suggesting, oh God, he did it again and I'm starved. Yeah, he's not left with much food to eat once that bird takes off, so. Shaw is a good one. Hunting for food in the time of Corona, but nobody knows what to do with a live bird. <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded of all of the, um, uh, you know, some, some folks have taken to trying their hand at baking bread, but don't really know how and are sharing all of their, their failures on, on social media. So yeah, it's, you know, you, you went to the store and all they had was a live bird. What now? Oh. <laughs> all right. Uh, are there any final, uh, Final sharings or thoughts or questions? Yes, about I just the... looked it up trip and it's uh, from Mexico sometime, someplace in Michoacan. It's okay, where the artist you. is from. All right, so from Mexico, not Bolivia. I was almost on the same continent. Well, the artist is from Spain, according to Lorena. Okay, thank you, Lori. Thank you for a great tour. We're going to leave right. now. Yeah, I think that's going to about do it for our Art to Lunch uh, tour this afternoon. Um, I do want to thank everyone for, for joining us. And we're going to try to do more of these um, in the coming weeks and, and months. You know, for as long as the museum is, you know, we can't have easy access to it. We want to try to bring a little bit of the museum to uh, to you all, to our members um, who support us. So um, keep an eye out for more Art to Lunch tours. As I said, um, I always try to kind of keep them light and keep them fun. So uh, if this um, if this appealed to you, you know, hope to see you on some future online tours. And hey, maybe when we're back up and running, uh, hope to see you in person for some art to lunch tours. So. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for taking some time out of your afternoon. Your base. It was great. Thank you. We love the laughs. Thank you. Take care.